Hi, everyone. I wanted to actually give you a heads up before we get into the interview today that we had some interesting interference. When I was interviewing Whitley about 10 minutes in or so, he begins to reference that he and his wife, who is now transitioned in the seats, are one. And all of a sudden, we experienced some interference throughout the rest of the podcast. We have no idea what this is. This has never happened before. I mentioned it to Whitley and asked him if Anne ever comes in and can distort some of the sound waves here. And he says it happens to him all the time. So we can't be for sure if it was actually contact with his deceased wife and she was here participating in the interview or if it was something else. But again, we've never had anything like this happen. So, um, well, actually, we've had it happen a couple of times with people who were channelers on the Path 11 podcast. Um, so, we don't know. We'll leave it up to you to decide, but wanted to give you a heads up that you're going to hear some interference um, with his voice, and it gets a little bit stronger towards the end. Maybe it's Anne, maybe it's not, um, but just wanted to let you guys know before you start to listen to this interview. It's actually quite interesting. So I hope you enjoy my talk with Whitley Strieber today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Path 11 podcast. I am very excited about our guest today. Very honored, too, to have him on, on our podcast. I'm sure many of you have heard of the name Whitley Strieber before. If not, you're about to learn more about who this man is. He really has been a pioneer in getting so much information out about the paranormal, um, about afterlife studies. Uh, we are going to hear more about his connection uh, with his wife, who passed over in 2015, but they are still very much in communication. Communication. He, he is an author of over 40 books. You might be familiar with one of his bestsellers called Communion, which really changes the way that the world thinks about um, the experiences that he has had. He had um, communication and has met with um, what he calls the visitors. And we are actually going to talk about that in the book that I am reviewing today, The Afterlife Revolution. Um, he is also known for having a wonderful website, unknowncountry.com. It's the largest in the world dealing with paranormal phenomenon. And he also has a podcast, Streamland, uh, which has been being produced for nearly uh, 20 years. So The Afterlife Re Revolution is a book that really has been inspired by his wife. Ann Strieber. Now, she had passed away, or we'll say transitioned, really. Passed away isn't the, the right words to use here, in August of 2015. And she returned to Whitley in a very convincing way. Um, actually, just an hour and a half after she made her transition, she was communicating with Whitley. And the afterlife revolution is really written by both of them. And I have so many questions that I would like to ask him. Uh, it was very impactful. So Whitley, welcome to the Path 11 podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I would like you, if you don't mind, just for our listeners who may not be familiar with your work, um, to help us understand a little bit about the contact that you made with the visitors, which also inspired the first book, Communion. So we can tie some of that into our conversation today, because you reference it a lot throughout the Afterlife Revolution book. Yes, all right. Well, what happened to me was uh, in... Um December of 1985, I woke up in the middle of a very bizarre situation with these peculiar looking beings around me. Um, I struggled mightily to get out. I, at, at first, of course, I, I thought I was having a nightmare. But when you're having an obvious nightmare and the harder you try to wake up, the more real it becomes, you get upset. And I did get upset. And then I, as I struggled, I heard a voice saying, what can we do to help you stop screaming over and over again? The answer was try something other than a mechanical voice <laughs> just saying that. So it was quite an experience. And I was extremely confused. Over the next um, six weeks, it gradually became clear that something really had happened. I had physical injuries. I went to the doctor. I described it what I remembered. And he said, well, it sounds like you're telling me you were taken aboard a flying saucer by little men. I said, well, uh, doctor it does sound like that. He said, well, we need to try an MRI scan and we need to get you hooked up with a psychiatrist and so forth. And I came out normal with all the tests, the psychiatric tests and the 
tests for temporal lobe epilepsy and the test, the, uh, the uh, MRI scan was normal. Everything was normal. And I ended up with the uh, head of psychiatry of the New York State, the head of the New York State Department of Psychiatry, who was an expert forensic hypnotist. At that point, we thought I had been attacked in some way. It was a criminal act. And uh, he proposed to hypnotize me in order to get at that the truth of it. it there was a ufo investigator called boat hopkins involved too but neither one of us really put much credibility in it the next thing i knew i went under hypnosis with dr donald klein who had solved many cases of like people being hit and run and then he hypnotized hypnotized them and they would remember the license plate number of the car that had hit them and then the police would find the car, that sort of thing. So he was really an expert at it. And um, what happened was this series of fantastic experiences simply exploded into my memory. It was utterly incredible. Nothing like it. I'd never expected anything like it, and neither had he. But Bud Hopkins, the UFO investigator, certainly had. And that was the beginning of my realization that I had had a close encounter with something. I don't know whether they're aliens or what they are. I mean, they never, they never told me where they were from, so I, I can't tell you that. But that was the beginning. <clears throat> then we published Communion. And the next thing that happened, we began to get letters. And this is where Anne's involvement started prior to this she was interested but concerned for her husband's mental health of course and uh but now she had embraced it she had uh, understood it in ways that n no one else ever had before and that i hadn't i mean she was the one who was leading the charge on this thing really uh so uh, we pup, we wrote communion. I wrote communion, and she edited it. And she would say, "No, no, don't don't draw conclusions. Let's keep this in question." We published the book. We began to get letters, and we got not just ten letters, or a hundred, or a thousand, or ten thousand. We got hundreds of thousands of letters. This was before email, uh, from all over the world about people having similar experiences. Now we're going to get to the end of this part. And what I'm going to say is this. One day, Anne walked out of her office and said, Whitley, this has something to do with what we call death. And that was the beginning of a whole new understanding of what the world is and how it works. And it goes right to the afterlife revolution. Because shortly after that, we had decided, we, the reason she said that was that the what people were thinking of as aliens might be that. But dead friends and relatives show up along with them all the time. People were reporting that time and again. It had happened in my experience. People would come to our cabin and have contact with the visitors. And uh, uh, it would happen there, where the dead would be there as well. So, And then all these letters, and we realized this is not what we thought. It's not aliens from another planet coming to, like scientists from the beyond to examine us, at least not entirely. It's got something much deeper to do with us. And we do have souls. Before this, we were both, both sort of typical materialistic skeptics. We didn't, I didn't really think of myself as having a soul. But then, when she said that, and we realized it was true that all these letters were saying what we were finding in our lives and at the cabin, she decided that we should make a pact that the first of us to pass would 
not come back to the other one directly, but instead would come back to friends if it was possible and tell the friends to get into contact. Because neither of us would have accepted the idea that the other one, if would had come back directly, we would have both thought it was our imagination. An hour and a half after Annie died, it happened. And at that point, I had forgotten all about that, that pact, all about it. Yeah, and you give a couple of examples, too, of people calling you and saying that they felt that Anne said that they needed to communicate to you and let you know that she was okay, and these phone yes. calls would come in. Mm -hmm. The first one happened at 9.30 that night. Annie died at 7.15 on August the 11th, 2015. At 9.30, a friend, Belle Fuller, called, and she said, uh, Whitley, I just heard Anne his voice tell me to call you. Is she all right? And I said, Belle, and he died at 7.15. Belle knew she was ill, but she hadn't been informed of her death. And um, I was sitting there asking Anne to contact me, actually, at 9.30. Over the next two weeks, this happened again and again and again with friends all over the country. And I finally realized I'm in contact with Anne. Anne is here. And that is still true. Anne is here. We, 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 we wrote the Afterlife Revolution together. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, she had another entry in Anne's diary, which is on our website, which is on unknowncountry.com. Perfectly incredible, beautiful entry. So the way I look at us now is we're two people still together, only we only have one body. So I wear both rings. You can see the, the both rings here uh, to, to symbolize that we're down to one body, at least for the time being. And soon we'll be without any bodies at all. But right now we've still got one left. So we're still going. Yeah, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit, too, about kind of the whole purpose of this book um, is also really t trying to bridge the gap, right, between this physical reality and having contact with those in spirit and just the overall consciousness. Um, and I, I love the one point in here when you were talking with Anne, you kind of transcribed it where you're talking about soul blindness. And she said, I tried to communicate with you in the very beginning and I thought you were ignoring me. Um, yeah. And that's that, one of the first things she said, yeah. she said, it, it looks like you're all ignoring us. Right. And that was so impactful. When I read that immediately, I started talking to my whole family that has passed away. I'm like, Hey guys, just want to say hello. You know, if you're here or, you know, around me, but it was put in such a way that was like, yeah, why aren't we tuning in a little bit more and paying attention and still communicating with the ancestors? So can you talk a little bit more about that concept of soul blindness? Well, we went soul blind as a, as, as, as a culture, not every culture on the planet is soul blind but the western culture is and if you if you got someone a, a scientist like michio kaku or someone like that on your show they would say they would probably be diplomatic about it but they would say basically you have no soul this is this is what you have and when you die that is gone and so are you in other words the five billion years of evolution that this earth spent creating us didn't have any meaning at all. It's just a random thing that flows through the universe. That's my, that was my assumption before the communion experience. I thought we were basically alone in the universe and we were basically material beings. And uh, that was it. And that was my belief. I prayed. Uh, I've always been a, uh, uh, something of a Christian. I was born Catholic, and like all Catholics, I've been up, down, and in and out over my lifetime. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but I didn't really think it was a kind of absolute reality. It was it was more of a habit. But then, 
after Annie died, she and and she had established communication. She began to talk to me and to tell me about this other world and to share the wisdom that she's gained, which is really beautiful. There are six or seven diary entries on unknowncountry.com. The latest one is from December the 2nd of this year that are beyond belief. They're so wise there. And what happens is I'm, I'm a terrible channel. I couldn't channel. I couldn't be a medium in the, to save my soul. I might save my soul if I could do it, but in any case, I couldn't do that. I'm too unsure of my own mind. You know, I think my mind would intrude. But every once in a while, Annie manages to get through. And when she does, there are these beautiful things that are said. Um, the... Uh, Here's the, the latest one. I'll read a little bit of it. This is a diary about inner peace. Everyone has inner peace, only we build a kind of shell around it. This shell is made up of fear and hate, and it's very, but it's a very brittle shell, and you can break through it. You break through it by remembering your heart. Remember what your heart was like when you were 10 years old, open and willing, Whitley talks about real will all the time, but this kind of will, the will of a child, is more real than the will of persistence and determination that he talks about. This is what Jesus means when he says, be as little children, because it is innocent, and innocent will is like the will of God. And it goes on like that. It, just beautiful stuff. Not something I would think of. I, to be honest with you, I'm too earthbound to to uh, to uh, uh, to to have said those words on my own. I think, but I, you never know with this. You have to remain unsure. So I have to ask you a question too. Um, have you ever had Anne interfere with the sound waves at all? Because as soon as you started talking about her and channeling some of her messages, your mic began to crackle. I've had this experience before with channelers. Oh, that happens all the time. Try try doing a podcast every week with, with Anne in the house. It's not easy. <laughs> okay, because that's what's happening right now. We yeah, are. Well, don't worry about it, and I hope your <laughs> listeners can endure it. There's okay. nothing whatsoever wrong with the equipment. There never is. I know. Yeah, and this happened to us um, with a channeler. As soon as she started to channel on the Path Love and Podcast, we had all of this interference. So as soon as that started to come in, I was like, "Hi, Anne. How you doing? Yeah, Thanks well, for Anne's joining here. us." Oh, she's <laughs> here. All right. She's definitely involved. Let me move the, the screen a little bit, and you can see her behind me. There she is, yeah. That's Anne's picture. Yeah, yeah she's, beautiful she's, book of her on here, yeah, too. Yeah, she's a, that is a, that is, she was a, you know, Anne was a, what I call a hidden master. She, she uh, did not, what she would have just laughed in your face if you'd called her a spiritual master. But that's what she was. And what she said things like, such brilliant, extraordinary things that that reveal a very deep understanding of the human journey. One of them is enlightenment is what happens when there is nothing left of us but love. And boy, I mean, that really catches you up short because in the Western world, we're always looking for, you know, I, you know, I, if I'm looking for enlightenment, then I want to go to Sedona or sit in a crop circle or I, I want to do stuff. But it's really an inner journey of letting go. And, and then all of a sudden you think to yourself, you know, no wonder if she was so interested in Buddha because she, you know, that's a very Buddhist concept. And, um, and in Jesus too, we wrote a book together. It just, it's not published yet. It's going to be published in January called Jesus, A New Vision, which is a completely new look at who Jesus was, what he did, and what happened to his teaching after he, did, after he, he didn't die. Let's, 
And we, we get into that in the book as to why that is not true. Uh, he something else happened to him. In any case, um, what it means to us now. So, you know, I have this immensely rich relationship with a person who's passed over. Mm. It's just so valuable. It's so I'm so grateful for it. None of it would have happened, incidentally, if it hadn't been for the visitors. As difficult as they were, and they're they're not pretty and they're not nice. I'm no two ways about it. They try, but it's hard. They're they're much more much sweeter to me now than they were at the beginning because I exasperated them. And these awful things would happen to me. And Annie would say, well, I'm not surprised. You know, you really are, as far as I know, the most annoying person I've ever known. You may even be the most annoying person in the world. And I said, well, why is that? She said, because you just don't see. In other words, I was the ideal student. If they could get through to me, and if she could get through to me, then anyone, they can get through to anyone. So that, that was what I ended up as, as the, as, the, as the worst possible scenario test case. And it worked. Here we yeah. are together, me and Annie. And my relationship with the visitors, which is very rich and very complex, proceeding now, is extremely comfortable and fabulously interesting. I mean, it's just it's challenging, too. I mean, you know, they're, they're here to work on the soul. And, um, you know, we have a large contingent of people in the government and the military trying to build weapons against them. And, um, and that's fine. I mean, they don't, they don't actually care because we can't, you know, <laughs> to be blunt, no matter how hard you try, you're never going to teach a chimpanzee to drive a car. Uh, and he will never understand it. And we're in the same boat when it, when it comes to technology and them. We never will understand it. But on the soul level, we are equals. And that's what interests them about us. We yeah. have beautiful souls. And, uh, you know, they can, if you don't watch out, they can be pretty nasty. Uh, but if, if you do try to live a good life, then your relationship with them changes. You live by love, compassion, and humility, which they have taught me are the three pillars of a strong soul. You really work at that. Then they work with you. Mm -hmm. This might be a good um, time to transition to the teaching that Anne was also trying to teach you about objective love. Can you talk yes. about that? Well, we have uh, most human love, as I understand it, is based in, it, it emerges out of contact. It's physical. It's the love of a child for a parent is a very contact-rich love. Uh, the love of two partners in, in life is contact-rich. But objective love is behind that. Objective love has, it doesn't have any, uh, it's not transactive, transactional, let me put it that way. Objective love is simply there. Annie said this, one of the things that happened immediately after Annie passed away is I found a book open on our bookshelf over here, it just, just, uh, here, let me put my hand, just a few feet away called Physics from Fisher Information. Annie knew a lot about physics. She was a really voracious reader in physics. And it was opened to a place in the book that had been marked in yellow pen, maybe by her or maybe by someone else, because the book was owned by others before it was a used book when we got it. And the book postulates that beneath all reality, there was information. There has to be, because something made the world look like it does. It doesn't just happen accidentally. There are laws back there somewhere. And the passage that was open to said this, that the universe 
or the Big Bang occurred as a fundamental, I'm trying to remember it, quest, yeah, a, a quest for knowledge that there was an, a, um, an awareness of an absence of knowledge and the Big Bang then occurred. And, and he said in another place, God noticed that the universe wasn't there. And the moment that happened, it was created. So I hope that sort of dances around, but toward your question, it's a complex question. Yeah. Um, it, no, it does. And I think that you get more into it in the way that Anne describes it in the book is really lovely, yeah, which yeah. is one of the reasons why people need to read it too. Um, I also, on page 31, you talk about how your relationship with Anne is deeper than it was when you guys were both in the physical. Um, you know, you were her companion in life, but now you're in communion with her. And yes. you talked about that too, um, in a couple of other places in the book about how that barrier of like the physical and the non-physical is kind of dissolving through the communication that you're having with her. So um, I'd love for you to describe, and I think that this might also help people who are grieving, who have lost, um, you know, their partner in life and, you know, how you handle that in, as a physical being and the grief, but then you have kind of transcended that and being in communion with her and understand your relationship to be with her different, like you said, she presents to you as Anne, so you know who she is, but she is more than that. And she's been explaining yes. that to you in the book too, that, you know, she is more than that. And she is here, right? Like right here, everywhere. Um, right. So can you try to put that into words of how your relationship okay. is? Well, it's, it, at least you don't ask simple questions. <laughs> that's for sure. No, that's a good question. A very good question. The first part of the answer is this. Uh, she said after she died, when I was so grief stricken, I did not think I could live another day. She said, Whitley, grief is another form of love. And uh, those words were powerful. They were very powerful because I began to understand that it was okay to grieve. And people will always say, oh, you'll get over it. No, why? You're still in love. Mm -hmm. And your grief is another form of love, and that's fine. That's the way it should be. So I still have my grief. I treasure my grief now. Um, and, but it has changed in the sense that <clears throat> there is in grief a lack of acceptance. Oh, why did it happen? I can't, can't I just go back? Can I have one more minute? One more but then you get to the point where you realize the grief is integrated into you. The loss is there. The physical body is no longer with you and never will be. I can open my arms and wish all I want, but she will never come into them physically again. Never. And so here I am on this journey alone in that sense. But I am absolutely not alone in another sense. The next part of the answer is this. Annie said, I'm not Anne anymore, but I will always be Anne for you. And I understand this very deeply now because, you know, we do have reincarnations. We certainly do. I have been led to the visitors have showed me like a couple, at least a dozen past lives that I've had. And I can relate to that actually. And um, they once showed me a l line of sort of framed pictures uh, along the wall of the bedroom. The top one was a picture of me as I look now and it was in color. And the others were all in black and white. All of them guys, I, I didn't see any women in there, which sort of surprised me because I thought we sort of went in different directions. And uh, then I thought to myself, this is a great lesson because it illuminates what Anne said. The soul behind 
the person I knew as Anne is now who is in contact with me. And this soul remembers not just the life she lived as Anne, but all of the lives that have ever that she has ever been through, and probably a lot more. We're big. We're not small. We're big and we're old. We just don't, don't think that way when we're in the physical, because we're not here to live in that larger context. We're here to move through time and have novel experiences. We've got like blinders on, so we only see, we only are always experiencing the new. Everything is new for us. We do not see the future. The dead do. Annie sees not perfectly. She said to me that we don't see the future completely, but we see before you see what is coming. And that's why she she said to me in September of uh, right before the last election, I asked her who would win, Trump or Clinton. And at that time, everyone assumed it would be Clinton because she was way ahead in the polls. And she said, Trump. And I thought, my God, I can't believe that. That must be wrong. And it turned out to be right. And with regard to this COVID thing, she said months ago, she said it will be very hard, but it will begin to come into focus in December. And after it's over, the world will be forever changed. And now it is December and what's happening, early December, and we've just got these vaccines all coming online. So she was exactly right about that, too. But they see a little more than we do, but not a lot more, because a lot of the future is indeterminate. Otherwise, otherwise the universe would have no reason to be. There would be no descent and there would be no discovery. If it was all already predestined and preordained, what would be the point? God wouldn't be interested in that. God is, God is an explorer, and we are his instruments of exploration, or her instruments of exploration. Annie would have said, she'd be mad at me for saying him. She was always said, she always used to say, you know, God might be a man and might be a woman, but as far as I'm concerned, my God is a woman because I'm a woman. <laughs> well, I feel like Anne is kind of like over my shoulder looking at what page I'm uh, going to be referencing to to ask the next question. And it was just all about this, <laughs> about them uh, seeing the future a little bit more. But um, one of the things that I highlighted that I really liked on page 60, you said the richness of surprise that fills the lives of those of us looking through a slit seems to me to be a treasure. Everything I've learned about myself has come from discoveries that depended on me knowing only in enough of the future, the past and the world around me to live in, in a continual state of surprise. So, yes. you know, again, like, I think she's like, okay, she's going to ask this next. Let me feed you some information. <laughs> I, guess, so. <laughs> I guess she's involved in this. She's, she's actually the director of the interview. We just, we can't see her, but she's here. Exactly. So, <laughs> so what I was, I, I what feel I like she's laughing at me right now. <laughs> what I wanted to kind of ask about that, you know, and like you said, like they know, they know, a little bit into the future, but not as much in that it's also not for them to kind of give us that information. So we can have a full life of surprises. Yeah. But um, I don't know if you've experienced like when you become more in alignment and in the flow of this energy and this, this greater consciousness, um, that there is kind of an intuitive knowing even though we don't know what will happen, but we know what direction to move in. And you can kind of get a little bit of a sense of maybe what the future will hold. You can still have experiences, but I feel like when you tune in a little bit more, more of that seeing is available to us. Would you agree with that? I feel that's true, and but I'm not so sure what its value is in this sense. The passage you read is about the, the living of life spontaneously in order to extract as much richness of the ex, out of the experience as possible. Um, and um, so that, you know, if you, if you, if we knew too much of the future, the energy of the experience would be lost to us and we wouldn't have any reason to live. That's what I always say to people who say, well, don't the dead know the future? I said, I will say they know some of the future, yes, 
but if they tell us it's it's destructive it, it would be that would be like an assault like slapping us in the face because we're here to have original spontaneous experiences that will come into our body our, our our being through the body through the impressions and the brain and so forth and then be transmitted to the soul in the ancient egyptian uh in ancient Egyptian thought, in the very early times, in the in the first religious document we have, which is the pyramid text and the Pyramid of Unas in Egypt, uh, the, they basically have the body, and then the spine, which is a they see as a column of light, of higher energy, that is surrounded by seven tanitter, as they're called in ancient Egyptian, that became the seven chakras. And uh, they uh, these gather information from that's coming in from the body and the mind, the brain, into the spine, and then transmit it into the so-called second body, which we would call the second body. They had a different name for it, obviously. And this second body then transmits it to the soul. And so the soul is here learning from life. And it has a very different objective. It doesn't necessarily all want sweetness and light. It wants life, life, live life. Uh, you know, Annie used to say in her life that the moment is all we have. And that, that is what it's about. Live your moments. Not try to get out of them and, you know, get the glimpses into the future so you can buy the right stock and stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, some of the, you know, when you were talking about the chakras, I specifically wore red for her um, today because, you know, she kind of had spoken to, I think it was one of the nurses when she was getting ready to transition, yes. where she said, I want to die in red, right? And you were yeah, talking. You... Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that color is very important. That was my daughter-in-law, and she didn't speak it aloud. It came into my daughter-in-law's head so powerfully. Annie spoke to us a lot after she could no longer speak physically. Um, and she, she said, my daughter-in-law said suddenly, Dad, Mom just told me she wants to die in red pajamas. And she jumped up and left the house and went out and found, bought a pair of red pajamas, and we got Anne into them before she died, and she died in them. Mm. And that color is important because it's an active color and she has, it was a symbol that her soul was going to be active in the world. Mm. Uh, she was, no, she was, Anne died and she died a conscious death. She had had a stroke in 2004 that had left her with a little minor brain damage, but unfortunately she then got a, a tumor and in 2013, and by 2050, they were unable to remove the whole tumor. And by 2015, it was um, uh, the weight of the tumor was causing her to have many, many small strokes. And she'd lost her whole left side of her body. And uh, she was going to die really a horrible death. I mean, it, it, because she would her... Uh, lung function might have ceased, par become paralyzed or something. So she said in late July, Whitty, I'm done. I'm leaving. And she did. Over the next two weeks, she stopped eating and drinking, which is legal. It was, it's, you know, they have different laws now, but in those days, there was no law in California that you could uh, decide to. Be, be assisted suicide was illegal. So I called the hospice and they said, yes, that's legal and she can do it. And we have the right to help her by giving her morphine and so that she won't feel the thirst and so forth. And that's how it happened. It took a few days. And on the last night, 
I heard her in my head say, Whitty, I'm dying right now. We were sitting in the other room eating dinner, <clears throat> the three of us, me and my son and my daughter-in-law. And I rushed into the bedroom. I lay my hand on her heart. And it beat, 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 and stopped. That's how it ended. It was so incredibly sad and beautiful at the same time. She had died a conscious death. And I had a, the privilege of witnessing the last beat of her heart because she had called me at that moment. Oh my, if anyone thinks we don't have souls or lives in that old, horrible, dead paradigm, please wake up. <laughs> yes, we do. And it's wonderful that we do. It's not something awful and it's nothing to do with medieval theology or anything like that. The soul is a rich and beautiful thing that is flying through space and time toward a deeper ecstasy than we can ever know in the physical world. And mm -hmm. that's why we're here. The other thing that really touched my heart was when Anne was talking a lot about laughter and kind of saying, yes. you, you guys take things way too seriously down there. You know, if you could only see from our perspective, you know, that you just, you're so focused and so serious about life. And that was a big uh, message that I took home you know, from your book, the, the book that you guys wrote together, um, was really about this laughter and, you know, connecting yes. that with God and the joy. And, you know, when you talk about whenever she would laugh, she would have this full laugh that would, big you know, laugh, kind of yeah. big laugh. Big um, laugh. And I thought that was an important message, too, to let people know. Um, so if you'd like to talk about the importance of laughter and why she was, um, you know, so adamant about that and about being joyful and spreading joy. Yes, because she think, she felt like that energy is the energy of, of change and of the energy of the higher soul. Uh, she had a, there was a teacher back in the Middle Ages called Meister Eckhart, who was very important to Anne. Her favorite sermon of his was, is titled, God Laughs and Plays. And that, that is really where she came from. Uh, her motto, the visitor said one thing to me in the whole experience out loud in words, they, they made other noises, yes, but in words they said, have joy. And I told Anne about that and she said, that's it. That's what it's all about, Whitley. That's what it's all about. And you know, I asked her once, what is joy? And she said, well, because I equated it with happiness. And she said, well, what's the difference? I said, what's the difference between joy and happiness, honey? And she said, well, happiness is when you get a new TV that you've been wanting. But if you want joy, hold a baby. You'll feel joy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that just, that tells you the whole thing. I mean, that was what her mastery was. It was so simple and so down to earth and so deeply, profoundly true. Uh, you know, you could spend years with a guru in India and never get a teaching as rich as that those 10 words. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. You know, when you say that she is a teacher there, some of the stuff written in this book that comes from her is so pure. And just when you read it, it resonates like down within the body in almost yeah. kind of wakes the reader up of like, oh yeah, I know this. You know, it's like she was able to wake up things that I already knew, but had forgotten, you know, some of that amnesia yeah, that we have. She she used to say in life, we all know everything we need to know. We just keep forgetting it. <laughs> no, forgetting that we do, not forgetting that what we know, but forgetting that we do. Yeah, I, I agree. And and so there were things that were waking up inside of me reading this book. Another the other thing that I just loved um that was such a visual moment for me was when she was talking about witnessing 
your light and how when she was free of the physical body, like her light was free and she was the light. And that when she was looking down at you, that she saw how the body kind of held the light in. Like, I think the words were something to the effect of like, your light is trapped in the body. Yes. And so, you know, when you kind of hear that metaphor where people are like, shine your light, be the light, find the light within, that took on a whole new meaning to me, you know, reading that and seeing it from her perspective. So I thought that was really phenomenal, too. Yeah, she was, um, she was very much, uh, she felt like light was conscious and she, she, we, we found together and uh, something uh, about light that's really very interesting, which is that light has played a huge role in man, mankind's spiritual journey. Uh, Akhenaten was the first one to articulate worship of light and his son worship. Then Zoroaster came, came along in a being of light he met in the in the wilderness while he was in search of meaning told him that there was only one god and then moses experienced the burning bush and then after jesus died and was resurrected the transfiguration occurred before the apostles uh and they were they they saw him turn into a being of light and then he came again to paul in order to extend his teaching out into the gentile world as a light so bright that it blinded paul and paul had to be carried into damascus because he couldn't see and uh that light is there it's in us all we have to do is to acknowledge its presence and that means that you have to live out of love you can't even begin and and compassion and humility the first lesson the visitors taught me and when i this is when i began to understand that as rough as they were and as tough as they were there there was goodness there too um was uh, about humility. It was a lesson in humility that was very powerful. And that's the foundation of my whole life that's spent since my whole inner search toward real love and toward facing the pain of compassion. Uh, and, you know, we, Annie and I went on that journey together in this life. And uh, she knew what real compassion was. She, she said, compassion isn't necessarily giving a bum a quarter. Compassion is finding what somebody really needs the most and having the courage to give them that. Mm. So when she pissed me off, she was being compassionate. She would always say, and I would say, no, you're not. You're not being compassionate. And then I would see where she'd been going, and I would understand what the teaching was. I had a wonderful teacher in my life. My wife. Still do. Still do. Exactly. Yes, still here. She is, and she's speaking loud and clear. I can't wait for you to listen back to this audio when you just um, spoke her words think? more. It's when phenomenal. You her like that, your voice, the tone of your voice changes. Really? Yeah, subtly, but it does. Hmm. Yeah, it's just so, it's so interesting. I, I've never met her, but I feel her. And clearly she's making her presence known through the audio. And when you, you know, kind of showed how you wear the two rings and how it's like the two of you have become one. Uh, just, uh, just fascinated by this whole interview too, where you can viscerally feel it and hear it. You know, it's like she's, she's through the sound waves. She's coming through you. She's coming yes. through the book. It's well, just uh, really it's an amazing, amazing experience. She's, she's, really she's, a, she's a powerful presence. And, uh, you know, her motto for our marriage that she made an across stitch that's in my bedroom to this day uh, was from Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one. And a cord of three strands is not quickly snapped. Mm -hmm. 
the third strand is love, out of which come children. And then we go on and down the road of life. The species goes on. That those two together in the final card of the tarot, the 21st card of the tarot of Marseille is the card of the world. And it shows us this figure, which is both male and female, ascending. And the four beasts of the Sphinx are around the four corners of the card to represent the fact that this in individual is in a state of balance and is two uh, rather than one. And if you read the Gospel of Thomas, which was was unearthed in 1947 after being buried for thousands of years, you will find Jesus talking about two becoming one. And this is what our journey has been, me and Annie. That's our journey. And uh, you know, that's where we are, mm. to become one. To become one. It's beautiful. And it makes me think of in the Bible, when two or more are gathered in my name, I am there, you know, and you talk yeah. about the triad and stuff. So, well, Whitley, thank you so much. Um, really an honor to have you here on the Path Loving Podcast to be able to talk to you and to personally be able to ask you all these questions that came to mind when I read the book, uh, The Afterlife Revolution, everyone. Uh, I would really highly recommend it. There is so much wisdom here. I am also so excited to read some more of Anne's uh, journal entries on your website unknowncountry.com as well uh, because I'm just enthralled with her message and things that she has to say and the wisdom that comes behind it so um, you know people can they can purchase your book through your website is that the easiest place to be able to get it or Amazon? Well, Amazon is the easiest place uh, and uh, if you want the paperback uh, you, you, you should be able to see it if it says it's out of stock uh, Google Afterlife Revolution paperback. At the end, I want to say the last words from Anne's the diary that she just created in, uh, on December the 2nd, and we'll leave it there. The heart of the matter was there before anything began. You can find that in yourself. The original seed of love is still inside you. So step out of the maze of confusion that is daily life and find your, your heart at the beginning of the world. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Whitley. Thank you. Take care.